the Indiana Fever successfully secure the number one pick in the 2024 WNBA draft. Just like Cleveland securing LeBron James and the Spurs securing Wemby, I'm sure this is purely a coincidence. I'm not going to spend this video talking about conspiracies and tanking, but this just seems super convenient. There's a lot of concern about college players taking their extra year of eligibility. The way the draft order fell is very enticing for certain players. Of course, Caitlin Clark is able to go to a team that has her boyfriend in the sibling organization and is able to be in a Midwestern market. Angel Reese has the temptation of going to the Los Angeles market. I know people think LA wouldn't draft Angel, but the marketing and money-making opportunities is too high for them not to deeply consider it. And even if she doesn't, they get Cameron, who is the perfect athlete to market in Los Angeles. The last lottery pick works out either way because Paige Beckers gets to succeed one of the biggest legends in WNBA basketball. If this wasn't a coordinated effort, then the WNBA is the luckiest sports league in history. But I'm sure you came for the title of the video, so that's enough about that. I'll look at the top four lottery teams and give a breakdown of what they should do in the offseason. And we'll start with Indiana. The Indiana Fever have a golden opportunity to change their franchise forever, just like how the Aces did with their back-to-back -back picks. I think Indiana has the ability to develop a super team if they make the right roster moves and develop players. I'll start with three things that Indiana should not do. The first being under no circumstance should they give up the 2025 pick. I think Indiana should make trades this offseason, but if they involve the 2025 draft pick, it's not remotely worth it. A bunch of players might exercise their extra year of eligibility, making 2025 extremely stacked. And even if it doesn't happen, there's still a ton of talented players available. The second thing Indiana shouldn't do is get rid of Grace Berger. Obviously, she is a hometown hero and a crowd favorite, but she's also a player with a lot of potential. I'll explain this more later, but I think she's the perfect fit for Caitlin Clark. It also helps she's on a rookie deal. I really hope Indiana doesn't cut her or give her away for nothing like they did Queen Eggbo. The third thing they don't need to do is overthink the draft. Sometimes the most obvious choice is the right choice, and that's drafting Caitlin Clark. Even in the doomsday scenario she gets hurt, drafting Caitlin is still the best option because they can just suck again and get another high draft pick to put around her. It's a no-lose situation for Indiana if they draft Caitlin. I talked about the things Indiana should not do, but what about the things they should do? Everything I'm about to say, and this video can be summed up, is based on one philosophy. It's surrounding Caitlin Clark with people she is comfortable and will work well with. Caitlin will immediately become the face of the franchise. This isn't any disrespect to Aaliyah Boston, but realistically this is what will happen. When you consider Caitlin's popularity and the fact it's in Indiana, she's going to be the main marketing draw. They already have billboards of her, and she hasn't been drafted yet. Literally the first video I ever did on this channel talked about Indiana getting rid of Erica Wheeler. Even without Caitlin Clark, I think they should do this. And it isn't just me. Indiana fans have been saying this forever. But with Caitlin being there, it's now or never. The odds of her and Caitlin getting along are very low. They are both ball-dominant players who take a ton of shots. Erica being there would hurt Caitlin Clark's development and is guaranteed to frustrate the fans. Caitlin will be too. This is a disaster waiting to happen. But here's what's tricky about this. Erica Wheeler is probably a negative asset at this point. She's the highest paid player in the league, but doesn't bring that value on the court. Anyone who would trade for Erica will most likely want something in return. If a team wants a first round draft pick for Erica Wheeler, then I don't think it's worth trading her. I think there's only two teams that would trade for Erica without asking for a bunch of picks or demanding a player like Nalissa Smith. That's the Connecticut Sun and Phoenix Mercury. The Connecticut Sun badly need guard depth. They could trade Erica for a pick or a random player because the Sun will be able to eat the salary. But the ideal situation would be to trade with the Phoenix Mercury and try to get Megan Gustafon for Erica Wheeler. She's a former Iowa player and a mini Aaliyah Boston, so she would be the perfect backup if Aaliyah Boston gets in foul trouble. Phoenix is most likely losing Skyler, and Diana's on her last leg, so I think Phoenix would make the deal. This might sound crazy, but I think the Indiana Fever should trade Kelsey Mitchell for Marina Mabry, and I think Chicago would be very willing to make the trade. Teresa Weatherspoon would not pass up on the opportunity to coach a player like Kelsey Mitchell, and I don't think they would have issues with keeping her there. Chicago might ask for a draft pick since they badly need them, but as long as it's not a first rounder, I don't think it's an issue. What would Indiana get out of this? Caitlin Clark will need an enforcer. WNBA players love taking cheap shots at rookies, and it's branded as a welcome to the WNBA moment. I'm sure people will feel some type of way about me saying that, but if you guys really want me to make a compilation of rookies getting cheap shotted, 
I can. Marina Mabry isn't going to tolerate people taking shots at her teammates. Indiana will need a player that has an edge and isn't afraid to get feisty. Caitlin Clark loves engaging in extracurricular activities, so it will help to have a player like Marina Mabry who will serve as distraction, especially when it comes to getting potential technical fouls. And it's a great fit on the court. Marina has played with Ogun Bawale, who is a very ball-dominant player, for multiple years, so she won't have a problem with playing with Caitlin. She's also a better playmaker than Kelsey, which will help with a team that has so many scoring options. Now what about the draft? We will assume Caitlin Clark is the first pick. If she announces she won't declare at the end of the season, then I'll revisit this. The challenge is figuring out what to do with the second round pick. Getting rid of Queen Egbo was a massive mistake, because now Indiana lacks a quality bench post. In the hypothetical I presented, Indiana would get Megan Gustafson. But if this doesn't happen, Indiana could sign Monica Sonato. She's undersized and struggles defensively, but she has improved her game overseas. And it helps that she has a lot of chemistry with Caitlin Clark. There's other post players they could pick up too. But basically what I'm getting at is that Indiana doesn't need to draft a post. There's a lot of talented guards that could help Indiana, especially coming off the bench. Someone always falls in the draft and I expect it to happen again. If she's still available, I think Indiana should get J.C. Sheldon. She's a fast-paced player which will work great with Indiana. She's a good three-point shooter and in general a good scorer which will help with bench depth. She also puts a lot of effort on defense. If she's not available, I think they should get Tahina Pow Pow. She has improved defensively this year and her three-point shot speaks for itself. She is able to run the floor and is a good playmaker which is great for Indiana. As far as the third round pick, it doesn't matter because Indiana would just cut them anyway. So what do all these changes amount to? This would be Indiana's depth chart going into next season. I'm not the biggest fan of Zowie B, but Indiana is so limited in post depth, I think they have to keep her and I wouldn't re-sign Maya Caldwell, as her lack of three-point shooting isn't going to mesh well with the team. The starting lineup would be Caitlin Clark, Grace Berger, Marina Mabry, Nalisa Smith, and Aaliyah Boston. It would be a mix of young players growing together, but also has a veteran presence. Earlier I mentioned Grace Berger would be perfect with Caitlin Clark, but why is that? Grace Berger is an excellent three-point shooter, solid defender, and a good playmaker. I think her biggest weakness is that she was too unselfish and didn't take shots she easily could make last year, but that would be a strength with the new Indiana team. She will be surrounded by four players who will have no problems taking shots. I think by as early as 2025, this could be the one of the most dangerous offensive team only behind the Aces and the Liberty. Teams will have to decide if they want Caitlin Clark to score over 25 points or if they want her to get over 10 assists. The defense is much better in the WNBA than it is in college basketball, but it's a similar thing we saw with Aaliyah Boston. Teams are much better and faster, but at the same time they can't build an entire game plan to stop one person. Nalissa Smith, Aaliyah Boston, and Mabry are all players who are hard to guard in one-on-one -on -one situations. And now Nalissa and Aaliyah Boston will be able to work with more spacing. They are typically players who get double teamed and they won't have to deal with that anymore. Despite being known for her shooting, Caitlin Clark is someone who loves driving to the basket. She will be able to kick it out to either Grace Berger or Mabry. If they try to guard the three, Aaliyah Boston will be able to do what she has been doing for years. Nalissa Smith is someone who can score anywhere. She has post moves but can also make mid-ranges and knock down three-pointers. When a team goes against the Indiana Fever, they have no idea who the leading scorer will be. As far as defense goes, I think they will be as good as Christy Sides makes them to be. Everyone has the ability to play defense on this team, even Caitlin Clark. It's about if she makes them play with effort and intensity. We'll see if that happens, it's hard to say. This might be a team that just relies on outscoring their opponent. In terms of bench, they would have a lot of options. I know Lexi Hull started several games last year, but I think Grace will work better in the starting lineup because of her passing ability and she's a lot more consistent with her jump shot. But Lexi does still provide a lot of value, especially defensively. I don't have a particular preference for Amanda Zowie B compared to Victoria Saxton. I think whoever looks better on the court should get the most minutes. As far as Emma Cannon goes, I would see if there's any better options the Fever could get first. If not, I would sign her to short-term deal again like they did in 2022. But either way, Indiana needs to focus on developing their younger talent because that's what is going to get them in championship contention. To beat teams like the Aces and Liberty, you will need a ton of firepower. Drafting Caitlin Clark and pairing her with Aaliyah Boston is a major step in making that happen. That's it for today's video. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts 
and give ideas on what you would do if you were the GM for the Indiana Fever. I'll do the Sparks next. But let's just say, well, I have a controversial opinion on what they should do with the second pick.